This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cavins. We're live on location. Nick Cattles, Greg Bedard, Greg Bedard Patriots podcast with Nick Cattles on a Tuesday afternoon. We just watched the second padded practice with the Patriots. And Greg, let's first start off with things that we haven't talked about yet. Of course, that's Christian Barmore, the blood clot situation. What do you think? Well, it's obviously a huge issue for the Patriots. Um, <clears throat> we know how valuable Christian Barmore is. I mean, they paid him. Um, and that always shows you the level of respect and what they think about the player in the future. I mean, the big question is when and if he can come back this year and beyond. Um, just in the past, dealing with these things, whether it's David Andrews, uh, Antonio Garcia, um, these things tend to take a while. Usually blood thinners are part of the, uh, the process to alleviate the issue. Right. The problem is, is that you can't play football when you're on blood thinners, and you also need it. You need it to run its course. So perhaps there's, you know, maybe maybe he's on it for like a month, but then he needs another month off to make sure it's all out of his system, that sort of thing. But I mean, look, Nick, it's it's huge, and you combine that with I'm sure something we're also going to talk about. You combine no Christian Barmore and no Matthew Judon, and all of a sudden we go from a defense that we expected to carry this team. Gerard Mayo said the other day. This team is going to win on defense yeah. and running the ball. And without basically two of their biggest difference makers, maybe uh, Christian Gonzalez would be the other one, it's a huge issue for this team. And so, you know, you just wonder how they're going to be able to compensate. I mean, they don't have anybody on the roster no. that is going to come close. I mean, we're talking about the Daniel Ekwales, Jeremiah Farms of the world. Um, not even close. Um the, pay, the good thing for the Patriots is that they still do get a lot of pressure with their scheme, and but without Christian Barmore, that guy in the middle that's probably going to draw double teams and free up other people, it's going to be tough sledding for the pass rush. Yeah, and you see across the NFL, I think we all have to adjust our expectations as far as interior offensive linemen, guards getting paid. A lot of people looking at Owenu saying, oh, he's making about $20 million a year. Is that too much? Well, Quinn Miners is getting $20 million a year in Denver. Hunt got $19, 20000000 million. And that speaks to the importance of the interior defensive linemen nowadays and that, that pass rush. You look at Chris Jones in Kansas City, how much of a difference maker he is. Of course, Aaron Donald before he retired. But let's look at Matthew Judon now. You mentioned it, Greg. We saw it play out yesterday here on the practice field. Everybody knows what happened by now. The conversation with Mayo walks away comes back, speaks with Grow, speaks with Wolf, and then walks away. Looked like he might have given a little bit of a, a parting shot as he walked off the field. Uh, reportedly was not at the facility today. This is a mess. Wow, there's a report out there that he wasn't even at the facility? Uh, I believe Phil Perry said that he was not at the facility. Wow. Um, that is, yeah, it's a mess. It, it, it really is from the way Judon, the whole thing, how this has played out, whether it was, you know, my report and him answering it, and then, you know, him talking to the media out of basically like thin air. We didn't think he was going to talk that day. And yep. him being so honest, which we've talked about, and it seemed like, you know, he even said, well, I signed the contract, so I guess I got to play on it, you know, even though I don't want to, to suddenly an open revolt during practice where, you know, there's a certain way of doing things. Like last year, he was in the same situation. And what did we get out of him last year? Last year was... I'm not talking to you snitches about my contract. <laughs> yeah. um, he went through conditioning instead of taking part in practice. He even would, he used that as an excuse to us. Like, oh, I'm just, I'm just working on my conditioning, making sure I need to be where I need to be by the time the season rolls around, which we all knew was a bunch of BS, to now this year, you know, he's openly talking about it for about 10 minutes in front of the media, being completely honest, which is fine. And Mayo was fine with it to him coming out to practice, sitting on a bunch of pads on a garbage can, looking like he's in open revolt. It's yeah. a complete 180. And, yeah. you know, and then you get into the whole interplay between Mayo and Judon, and then Judon comes back out, and then he goes to Wolf and Grow during practice, and he's not happy about that. And Robert Kraft is in the middle of things. I saw Robert Kraft out here today talking to Devon Godshaw, another guy in a contract impasse with the Patriots. So. Yep. I, look, do I think this is like a big deal? Like in terms of, do I believe like things are out of control with the Patriots? No, 
It's just that people around here aren't used to these things. Right. I've covered different teams. <laughs> I've been around the NFL. This kind of stuff goes on all the time. As long as it gets uh, resolved at some point, whether that he gets more money, he's happy here, or he gets traded, you know, at some point, that's all that really matters. And so it's not a good look. It's not a good look for Judon. It's not a good look for Mayo. But I don't think it's a huge problem. You know, I felt this whole time that it was more likely that Judon would get taken care of over Godshaw. But after how things played out yesterday, I just felt like there was a 180. And I don't know what you do as a team. This is a tough situation because you've got a first-time head coach. He's trying to set the standard. And now do you want to set the precedent, Greg, of, of having somebody really show up the organization? That's what Judon did yesterday. Uh, look, if you have an issue, I get it. He's, he's irritated. He should be frustrated by the contract situation with what he's getting paid. But you can't do what he did yesterday. You cannot show up your organization in front of everybody out here in public. And I, I just wonder if, you know, if you bring him back and you give him what he wants, even if it's a little bit of a tick up and pay this year, is that setting a precedent where now other guys see that and say, oh, okay, now I'm going to act like Judon did, and maybe I'll get my money. I, right. I don't know what you want to do with that if you're Gerard Mayo and Elliot Wolf. Well, I do think, you know, this is where Gerard Mayo comes into this because he's the head coach. He's responsible for the way things go down. Yeah. And thus far, it looks like, to me, this is just my opinion, that – you know, he, he, he was worrying so much about changing the culture after Bill, loosening things up, letting the, the players express themselves, that he didn't sit and think about, all right, well, what if it goes badly? What if X, Y, and Z happen? Like, I, I understand the good that could come of this, yeah. but what's the bad? And then also, like, I don't put it all on Judon. I think that Mayo bears responsibility in this because if he, if he didn't think to set the parameters to be like, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to let you guys express yourself. We're going to give you more freedom. But this is what I expect in return. And if I don't get it, then I'm going to be pissed. Yeah. And it's obvious that there weren't any boundaries put on this because I, I, I think that Matthew Judon would have respected it. But, you know, who knows? Maybe some people got in Judon's ear and said, and especially with Drew Rosenhaus, Devon Gotchow's agent here yesterday, that's usually a sign that Gotchow is going to get taken care of. That's normally how things go with Rosenhaus. He comes in, gets face to face with people, they find a, some resolution, and then Judon hears about that, and he's like, "Now I'm the last one." Right. And, and nothing's and, being done. And it looked different to, at least to me, the conversations that were happening. Judon, it certainly seemed like there was a little bit of an irritability yep. between the sides. After practice, I saw Godshaw speaking with, you know, Rosenhaus. First, Rosenhaus spoke with Matt Groh. It was right in front of me. He speaks with Groh. Groh walks away. Godshaw comes up. Rosenhaus and Godshaw speak for about five minutes. And then Mayo comes over, and it's Godshaw, Mayo, and Rosenhaus all talking. And you could see, you know, Godshaw kind of pushing Mayo playfully, and they're kind of laughing with each other. It at least seemed, again, we're going off body language, which is always difficult. I think we understand the Judon thing now since he's not here <laughs> today but you know the the Godchow thing looked like Greg that it was somewhat amicable and yeah. that the two sides were getting along at least in that conversation yeah no I, I completely agree with your characterization of that and um, we'll have to see and I also think Nick this this is a little inside football but I don't think I've never I looked up Juden's Jud, Judon's agent I've never heard of him yeah normally when you get that that's more like an advisor yeah. slash lawyer just to look over the contract. well Judon did say on that podcast that came out last night that he came up with a contract offer mm -hmm. put it together and gave it to the Patriots so it sounds like Judon has a heavy hand in what's going yeah, on this this is the downside of that like yeah. you can say all right I'm saving the three percent or whatnot or I've been through this and I know what's what but at the end of the day, there's a reason why you, you hire someone to handle your business so that you don't have to get in, involved in this. Someone's representing your interest, and you can concentrate on the field. Yeah. Let's talk quickly about Jabril Peppers. He was out there yesterday with the training staff at the training shed way in the back. Uh, looked like they were looking at a foot or an ankle, a leg, something lower leg injury issue. Goes out there, takes one snap, walks off the field. That was it. Unstraps the helmet. He did not practice today. He was out there walking around, though. Uh, just kind of the overall, the accumulative effect, Greg, with, you know, the Judon stuff happening, major player on your defense. Barmore happening, major player on your defense. And now you've got Peppers 
come up lame. <laughs> pretty pretty big impact player on your defense. Yeah, for sure. How I mean, we feel about yeah, all this? Yeah, hopefully it's minor. Um, you know, we saw guys out there like it seemed like Joshua Bledsoe got a lot more time, along with um, Jalen Hawkins has been out there as the free safety. But yeah. there's no question that. You know, when you look at this team and they just gave him an, a contract extension, Jabril Peppers is the heart and soul of this defense. Yeah. And they're one of the emotional leaders. And, you know, hopefully it's just minor and, and he's back. Uh, the good thing is there's a long ways to go until they start games in September. All right, we'll get to the quarterbacks. But first, here's a word from game time. It's the middle of the summer. It's hot. But you know what summer means to me? Baseball. I love going to the park. I love supporting the Old Town team. And when I want to go see my favorite team, Game Time is the perfect place to go. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time act actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seats, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying baseball tickets. I was just looking at the website, gametime.co. They also have the app, Game Time. I was looking, big event coming up, a New York team coming to Boston, red hot hometown team. I got to tell you, they have, the prices are a bit pricey for the first game of the series, but guess what? On Game Time, they have these things called flash deals. So an outfield grandstand ticket that normally costs 152 bucks, it's 132 bucks, 20 bucks off. That'll get you in the park. That'll get you a good view. Nobody in front of you, no poles in front of you. That's the kind of stuff you find when you go over to game time. I, you know what I also love about game time? Well, there's a few things, okay? I love seeing the view from your seat on my phone before you buy. That's a must. I won't buy tickets from any place unless it has that. Game time has it. Also, the all-in pricing. Shows your total cost up front. You know, you go to these other sites and you're like, oh, that's a good deal. Suddenly you get to the end and there's all these fees and taxes and other things. And all of a sudden you're paying double than what you thought. That does not happen at game time. So make sure you get over there. Take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account and use code CLNS for 20 bucks off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code. CLNS for 20 bucks off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Let's get to the quarterbacks now, Greg. Jacoby Brissett, I have not been here until yesterday. Uh, he looked really good yesterday. Today, not as good, but first two days of padded practices. How do you feel about Jacoby Brissett? Yeah, I think Jacoby's looked uh, pretty good the, these last couple days. I think it was, you know, the first four days without pads, it was really sketchy. For the offense as a whole, I do think that uh, yesterday he was really good. Today we saw uh, they got into a little bit more situations yeah. with red zone, a little bit of hurry up. Yep. Um, Jacoby had the really nice pass on the first snap of red zone. Touchdown to Hunter Henry. Sort of the first time Hunter Henry has popped in a very long time. I mean, he, he was going against Bledsoe. Just a perfect pass from Jacoby Brissett. Other than that, it was a little little dicey there there was uh there was another lap done by the offense that's been a theme the past couple days yeah. where they broke the huddle and it looked like it looked like it was Jalen Polk was lined up in the wrong place and Jacoby Brissett got mad and looked like he was yelling in the direction of Tyler Hughes the wide receivers coach um so there's some of that going on but I think Jacoby's been as advertised so far like he knows the offense he's calming you know, he's pretty good under pressure. He delivers the ball, uh, knows what he's doing with the ball, and, you know, that's in stark contrast to the younger quarterbacks on this team. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to uh, Drake May in a second. I, I just kind of echo what you say about Brissett. M much more control of what's going on out there than the other guys. And then you look at Drake May, and May had a rough day yesterday, not much better today. Has not been uh, has not been great for the rookie in the last couple of padded practices, Greg. Yeah, I, I this is sort of three straight down days for for Drake May today. In the main team period, he was one of six and had a fumbled snap with Antonio Maffi. Now I will point out, even though this is no excuse for him, 
even though people on Twitter love to use it as an excuse. Yes, he is working with the backup line. Um, Mafi's a train wreck. Yes, and he, he is can't snap the football, which seems to be important when you're a center. <laughs> yes, he 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 has been a train wreck. He is every shotgun snap is an adventure. Um, <laughs> Everything's that. So what Greg's talking about is literally every shotgun snap is at the shoestrings of Drake May. He has to go down and get it, head. or yeah, it's over his head. Yeah, and. This is a byproduct of David Anders has missed the last two practices. Yep. So Nick Leverett is now the starting center. Antonio Maffi, because Jake Andrews is on PUP, is not out here. It might be time for them to sign some sort of center yeah. somewhere to come in because this is getting ridiculous. Now, it's no excuse for May. And no. what I've seen out of May, especially today, and it really came home in that main team period where he's one of six, he is now at the stage where he is thinking too much. He has rookie brain lock. And, look, I'm not overly concerned. He's going to go through this stuff. Um, where he is doesn't make a difference to me. I always – he was going to need to be brought along. Um, did I have the thought today that going up to number two snaps was maybe a little bit too soon for him? Yeah, I had that thought today. But um, – I want to see how the kid rebounds, and we'll see how things go. Yeah, a couple things on May, and again, this is not to excuse the way he's looked because he, he hasn't been good, and he hasn't been good the last two days for sure. But I also think he's not getting much help out there. The offensive line has not been very good. Um, you know, Mitchell Wilcox dropped a couple of footballs for him yesterday that hit him in the hands. So overall, that unit has been a little bit sloppy and well behind the, the first string guys. So I would say that. And also, just a reminder, because I do see people – jump into these grandiose c conclusions about Drake May. Mm -hmm. and everybody settle down. Everybody take a breath. We all talked about this before the draft. Greg talked about it. I talked about it. Everybody and their mother talked about it heading into that draft, which was May is not polished. He's not a polished prospect. He is going to be raw. It's about potential. And drafting Drake May, to me, was more about 25 and 26 than it was yes. about 2024. 20, mm -hmm. So we have to keep that in mind. It doesn't mean he's going to be great. But, you know, the first couple of padded practices, we knew what the Patriots were getting into when they drafted him third. Yeah, you know, without question. And people are overreacting to the comments that I made to Felger and Maz yesterday where I said, Mac jo there's no question, Mac Jones was way ahead of where Drake May is right now. That is not breaking news. We knew Mac Jones was the most pro-ready quarterback coming out of that draft. He yep. had been in pro-style offenses. He had been coached by Brian Dayball, Steve Sarkeesian, Nick Saban played with, you know, NFL draft picks in an NFL, basically the 33rd team in the NFL. Yeah. In Alabama at the time had played a lot of football, you know, in high school, um, bided his time at Alabama. Drake has not played a lot of football. But, you know, here's the thing about Drake May and where he is. Yes, I said that about Mac Jones. Now, a lot of people are just thinking about Mac Jones last year. No, no, no. This is a much different Mac Jones that I'm talking about. And that Mac Jones, as a rookie, was also way ahead of two guys who are going to the Hall of Fame, Patrick Mahomes and Aaron Rodgers. That's where Mac Jones was. You just didn't know what his ceiling was. We found out that was about his ceiling, his rookie year. And not to mention, this guy was second in offensive rookie of the year balloting at the end of his rookie season. And so... You can't compare Drake May and Mac Jones. No. And I'm not comparing them. But what I'm just saying is Drake's starting from a much lower point, and it's going to take him time. They just need to build him up the right way. And, you know, we don't know the answer to that. We're going to have to see how this thing goes along. Yeah, I tweeted out earlier today. Uh, you can check it out at Nixie Radio. The Jordan Love stuff from 2020 and 2021, you know, everybody – proclaiming that love was going to be a huge swing and a miss. Dan Orlovsky saying it looks like he was a terrible pick. And, and Jordan Love was very raw and didn't have a lot of football experience. And we forget Drake May's story. You know, the COVID year messing around with his high school season. He only played, you know, two years at North Carolina, switched offensive coordinators from year one to year two. So he's, again, he's raw and he's really young. And there's a, one more thing on that. Somebody tweeted me today a podcast that Tyreek Hill did at one point in time, and they, he was asked yeah. about Patrick Mahomes, and he was just – even Tyreek Hill said, as a rookie, Tyreek Hill was like, this is the guy we drafted? Yeah, said like, he thought he was trash. Yeah, he thought he was <laughs> trash. And then he talked about 
all of a sudden year two, how much improvement coming into year two, it was like night and day. Like that's what, that, and remember, Patrick Mahomes didn't play outside of one garbage start in week 17. Right. Like the idea is to do what the Chiefs did with Patrick Mahomes. And maybe Drake arrives earlier than that and plays earlier. We will see. But the idea is to let him develop and it's the future. You're right. 2025, 20, 26 and beyond just making you sure you set the right foundation for him. All right, some rapid fire. I'm yep. waiting for lunch. I'm starving. So let's get to the offensive line. Looks like they're settled, Greg, for yeah. now. Looks like it's Caden Wallace, left tackle, City So, left guard. David Andrews missed the last couple days of practice, but obviously when he gets back, he will be at center. And then you've got Owenu, right guard, and right tackle, Chooks for. That's been there five for the last three or four practices. What have you seen? Yeah, I, I think it's looked pretty good. I mean, obviously getting David Andrews back in the middle will make everybody look a lot better. I, Caden Wallace has not looked like a fish out of water at left tackle. He's done a good job. He's done a good job in one-on-ones. Uh, City So has done a really nice job. Yeah. Um, you know, I like Nick Leverett um, as, as a backup center, and he can play all the interior positions. Michael Wenu has been ridiculously good. He was crazy him. good yesterday. And he, he he actually did have a loss today against Keon White. That's his first loss in one-on-ones. But he's been outstanding. A core four, I don't know. We're going to have to yeah. see. He's been a little bit iffy on the right side. Uh, I don't know if it has to do with you know switching from left to right. Um, I, I'm, I would also be interested to hear the rationale between switching them Wallace and a core four, you know, it could be just as simple as, you know, if you line up a core four on the left with City So, it's a bit of a finesse left side of the line. The yeah. right side's more powerful. Yep. By swapping them, you're now more balanced as an offensive line, and it could be as simple as that. But, you know, so far, I think I think the returns have been promising. You know, I'm not going to say they're good. They're going to be gangbusters, but, you know, I think they've been really good. They've been really good in the one-on-ones. I haven't tallied up today, but yesterday they dominated the defensive line. Again, without Christian Barmore and without Matthew Judon. But they're off to a good – Scott Peters and Robert Kugler so far are off to a good start in pads. Yeah, and the run game looks a little bit more together yep. than, than – you know, past years, especially when they made that switch to Patricia back in 2022. It looks a little bit more together. The run game's been popping a little bit. Just thoughts overall defensively? Uh, defensively, I think, you know, the they've been able to scheme up a lot against the Patriots. They There, there have been some free rushers. Um, I think the defense, the run defense has been good for the most part. They're, you know, the, the offense has battled them and, and certainly popped some runs. But... Um, yeah, I think I think the defense has been good so far. I can't wait to watch it. You know, they'll get a rest day tomorrow. They probably yep. won't be in pads on Thursday, and then get back at it on the weekend to see these guys compete more and more. He's Greg. I'm Nick. That'll do it for the podcast today. Uh, two padded practices in the books back on Thursday. We'll see what it looks like. Until then, be well.